Hey, good morning, Real Life Church. How many of you glad he's the way maker? Say amen. That's good stuff. Yeah, give it up for him. I'm so excited to be here. This Party People series um, was a blast when we did it. It is available in our archives online. So if you want to go back and kind of watch what the whole thing was about. It came from the idea that I started, we started just looking around and how many of you know that there are some church people that can come across as not so happy? I say some, some, um, yeah, they really know some over in this section right here, like like they're writing down names and stuff. Don't do that. Uh, No. uh, And so when you actually study the people of God, even, even when you go back to the old Testament, uh, pre Messiah, you have the children of God, they celebrated throughout the year. There were festivals and, and different things that the Jewish people did and still do. Uh, and they were celebrations of what God had brought them through and what God had done in their life. And, and they, they would set a marker in the sand. Hey, this, we're going to celebrate this. And, and then they would. And so people became, they, they became a people of celebration. Almost, if you were to look at your calendar now, and if you would add international holidays as an option on your computer calendar or whatever, you would see the different Jewish festivals that come up as these people of God looked back and realized when, when Passover occurred. There was a celebration that happened when, when these, the, the festival of the tents, when that happened, there were celebrations that occurred that said, hey, we're so thankful what has happened has happened to get us to the point where we are today. And so I think that even for us, as we look and we celebrate this day of, of J- July 4th, we can look back and go, man, we're really thankful for the sacrifices that have been made that have given us the freedom to do just this. To be able to meet in a room together and worship Jesus Christ and to do so freely without fear of of someone coming in to tell us to stop. It's a blessing that we we ought to be a happy people, amen? amen? But even more than our social freedoms that we have through our our location and, and where we live, in Scripture you find this pattern. Something is lost, something is found, and then we celebrate. Something is lost, something is found, then we celebrate. You can see it throughout the scriptures, no matter where you turn. If you go to the New Testament and you see Jesus teaching about a prodigal son who was lost, who became found, and then we killed the fatted calf and we celebrated. You can see it with the lost sheep that left the 99 and he was lost. And then when he was found, there was a celebration that occurred. When David was going through his journey in the wilderness and he had fought, stepped away from God as somebody who was lost. And then Psalms 51, that prayer of repentance, Lord, renew in me a right spirit, cleanse me. Then he was found. And then there was celebration as he took over as the king that would be a man after God's own heart. We see just that pattern throughout Scripture. Lost, found, celebrate. How many of you remember what it was like to be lost? Say amen. Amen. How many of you are thankful that you are found? Say amen. amen. How many of you don't celebrate it like you ought to? I mean, you could have just said amen really big right there. It would have been fine. We kind of had a rhythm going. I don't know. You just, just everybody bailed on me right there. And so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. What does it mean to be found? What 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 is that? What is the perks of being found? And so before we get into that, I want to I want to set you up for next week. All right. A lot of you don't know this fellow, but you're going to be introduced to him in the next week. This guy right here is our nine foot inflatable pink elephant. We have not named him. Okay. But next week, we are going back to a sermon called Elephant in the Room. And so this guy is going to be all over town this week. He's going to be at different locations, and you can stop and take a picture and post us in it and all that good stuff if you'd like to. Hey, real life, I'm here with the pink elephant. The whole premise of this series was that we wanted to talk about the things the church wasn't talking about. What are things that are happening in our world today that the church needs to address from a biblical point of view? that they just aren't. What's the elephant in the room? And so this series has, was really powerful. It came out about the time when we were trying to decide which bathrooms we were supposed to use. I don't know if you guys remember that a couple years ago when that question was asked. And I think it confused a lot of people then as much as it still confuses people today is why is that even a question? 
that's the world we live in currently. They're asking questions that maybe at one point were never questions. And so we want to challenge you this week. I want to challenge you this week. Go on some of our social media. Ask a question. If you don't want anybody to know, send the church a message through social media. Email us at info at rlclive.com and say, hey, could the church talk about this? We're not going to be able to hit them all, but what we may do next week is just hit a wide variety of just one shot kind of random sermon. We're going to talk about this, 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 and this next Sunday. I'll try to keep it within the time frame, but if not, come to the 1130 because I can preach all day in that one. All right. <laughs> so uh, that's what's coming next week, the elephant in the room. Be watching for the elephant, all right? He'll be around town when you see it. Take a pic. Let us know that you saw him. Let us know that you found him. We're going to have a good time. Y'all excited for elephant in the room next week? Yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun. So let's dive into this today. What does it mean to be found? Any of you ever been lost before? I mean, like, I don't mean like spiritually lost. I mean just like really lost. Like, oh, where am I? Like that? Got a few in here. Any of you, any men, any men been lost? It's good you admitted it. Praise Jesus. You're like, well, my wife's not here today, Vince. I could go ahead and raise my hand. <laughs> no, it's, it's bad when you're lost. I, I don't know if you've ever... If you've ever been in that position when you're looking around and you can't find, like I don't, I don't remember ever getting lost while I was driving because <laughs> I wouldn't admit to it if I had. Um, but like I can remember when I was little, where I lived, we had, we had a mall. And I can remember kind of being at that age where it was like, hey, you can go check out what you want to go check out, but meet me at the food court at one o'clock. And uh, no, you stay right here with me kind of age. And I can remember being at that age and I can remember taking three steps away from my mom and turning around, and she was gone. I don't know if it was intentional on my mom's part. I'm still, when I get to heaven, I'll ask her. Um, but, uh, but I can remember in that moment being lost and just wandering. And, and when I mean not wandering, but wandering, I, I just kind of started cruising the mall. Where did, what were stores that she went into? Where would I find her? J.C. Penney's is on that end. I got to go there because that's probably where she's going to be. And so I can remember wandering her around, but I can also remember getting to a place where I started getting a little anxious when I couldn't find her quick. And I don't know if you've ever done this before, but people say if you want to know the anxiety of a child, go to Walmart, get on your knees, and try to walk around it because that's the view from a child's perspective of what Walmart is like. It's pretty overwhelming. And so I was walking around going, I don't know where she's at. I don't this was pre-cell phones, because good Lord, what did we do back then? I'll tell you what you did. You found the guy that had the suit on or the, uh, the officer's uniform on that said security, and you start tugging on his pant leg and you go, I don't know where my mom is. That's exactly how I did it. Don't judge me. All 17-year-olds react differently, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I was like 16. <clears throat> but they intercom my mom, and she found me, and she was happy to see me, I guess. And I can remember the relief when I, when, when I saw her. When I was like, it's good to be found. It's good to not wander. You know, to, to not be kind of wondering where I go, what do I do, how do I get to the next place. And, and sometimes we as Christians, we get in this routine of believing that being found really the greatest and the ultimate and the only real benefit of being found by Christ is that we get heaven. Now listen, I'm, 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 I am jacked about heaven. Like, it's going to be fun. I mean, I can't wait. All right. The Bible says that God, Jesus himself has gone to prepare a place for me. And I get, nobody knows me like Jesus does. And so whatever place he has prepared for me is going to be perfect for me. And he's went there and he's spent quite a bit of time now preparing that place. And I'm excited about going and I'm ready. When God wants me to go, I'm ready to go. Now, like when I say that, please don't hear this false spirituality, you know, and, and, and can I just be honest with you? You know, people all the time are like, oh, if the Lord calls me today, I'm ready. That is true. I am ready. If Jesus comes right now, let's do it. 
But there's also a part of me that wants to see my, my grandkids. You know, I've, I've got six kids and only three of them are out of the house. I'm only 50% there. <laughs> and one of them's only four, so I have years <laughs> before she's gone. But I want to, I want to, I mean, think about, I have six kids. Prayerfully, they're all going to have kids. And if they all have kids, you know what my house is going to look like on Thanksgiving? Heaven. That's what it's going to look. Because I'm a big family guy. I want people sitting at the kids' table forever. (laughs) I want kids to sit at the kids' table. I want grandkids to sit at the kids' table. I want great-grandkids to sit at the kids' table. I'm just, it's how I'm wired. It's how I grew up. It's what I want. And so, like, I'm, I'm excited about heaven, but... But the reality is that heaven's a perk. Like, man, when I leave this life, my life doesn't end. I get to step from this life into the next life. My next breath after death will be Jesus face to face. And he'll say to me prayerfully, and and as much as I've studied, I don't know that there's any other option that his words to me will, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into thy rest. And I get to go to heaven, and it's going to be good. Be Twizzlers and Oreos. And not the weird Oreos, just the originals. <laughs> Double stuff, that's it. I, I'm excited about How many of you are excited about heaven? Yeah, how, but how, how many of you know that there are perks here too? To being found. There, there's, there's some good ones that we miss. And we miss them because, well, frankly, we get really comfortable Get really comfortable. And so I want to dive into this. What does it look like to be found? What, what, are, what are the things? What does it look like? What, what is it for you? And so it means, first and foremost, that you have the power to defeat sin in your life. This idea of being found means that you have the power to defeat sin. Say amen, church. Amen. Listen, I want to make sure I'm clear on this. It doesn't mean that you will not sin. It means that you have the power to defeat sin, so you ought not be living in sin. It ought not be continual in your life. And let me just get on your toes right now or in your lap, however you want to take it. It doesn't matter your personality. It doesn't matter who made you mad. It doesn't matter your nationality. If you're, it doesn't matter any of that. If you are continually living in sin, it's a problem. But the power that we have when we are found gives us the ability to defeat it. We don't have to be ruled by sin anymore in our lives. And people go, whoa, 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 Pastor Vince, I'm still going to mess up. That's great as long as you don't use I'm still going to mess up for messing up. You know what I mean? Like when people was like, nobody's perfect. Well, that's just you saying you had planned on messing up anyway. Well, I'm always going to struggle with sin. All right, let's break down that statement then. Are you struggling with sin or are you just not fighting against it? Because if you tell me you're struggling with sin, then you ought to be bloody from the fight. Or you were just going, well, you know, it's just something that's kind of there and I, 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 really, I really struggle with that. I don't know that we struggle as much as we say we struggle. I mean, it sounds good to say we struggle with sin, but the reality is that for some of us, and even in my life at times, there had been sin in my life that I just knew was there. And I was able to grace cover it instead of actually struggle with it to get rid of it. I was able to go, well, the Lord knows who I am. The Lord knows me. He knows, what I, he knows what my weaknesses are, and so there's extra grace for that. And the reality is, no, he, his spirit, when I said yes, when I became found, gave me the ability to defeat sin in my life. I don't have to succumb to the things that I used to. I don't have to fall to the temptations that I used to. Let's see what Scripture says about it when we get into it. It's Romans chapter 6, verse 5. Now, I'm going to be bouncing between these three points into three different places in Scripture. So, Typically, I'm not topical. More, I'm usually more expositional. Just let's break this down. But today, I needed to jump to make sure that you get these, these, these perks to being found, these, these benefits to being found in Christ. Here's what it says. Since we have been united with him in his death, 
we will also be raised to life as he was. How many of you would lo love that verse? We get to be raised to life. Now, a lot of people, when they see raised to life, they mean they think it's talking about going to heaven. That's not what this part of the scripture means. It means that even here on this earth, the old me is dead and there has been a new me raised to life. There's a new me raised to life. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power. Sin might do what, church? Lose its power. If we have had an experience with Jesus Christ, if we have submitted our lives to Jesus Christ, then sin has, according to Scripture, lost its power. You know the only way you give an animal power, right? Is to feed it. So you, you won the battle with sin at your salvation. So if sin is now winning again in your life, it's because there's a feeding issue. You've been feeding it. We were crucified so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. No longer, we're no longer bound by it. Jesus has set us free. If we're no longer bound by it, then we can walk away from it. Please hear me this morning when I say, I don't think, and I don't intend this to be received as like, oh, you can just walk away from your sin. I know the grip that it has on a lot of people, depending on what the sin is. I don't even know what it is in your life. But I know in my life, it wasn't just I got up from an altar and, all right, I don't ever want to think about that again. That's, that's not what happened. It's a daily choosing Jesus. It's a daily choosing Jesus, sanctifying my heart, sanctifying my choices, sanctifying my life. It's me going, I know I don't need to be in that environment. And then two days later going, this environment is so much more comfortable than fighting against this environment. Anybody with me on this? But we're found. You see, we're found. We're, we're his. We're no longer ours. He says we're no longer a slave to sin for when we died with Christ we were set free from the power of sin. We spend this whole weekend celebrating freedom. We spend this whole weekend, why? Because a country, a nation, a people that was lost found its freedom here through trial and through, through battle and through blood and through sacrifice. And, and guess what? We now get to celebrate freedom. I wonder as a believer, have you walked through the same battle with sin? Or, or are you just walking with sin? knowing it's there, wishing it wasn't. See, there's a difference. I wish I'd lose weight. How many of you wish you could lose some weight? I won't tell you the analogy my father used to give me when I said I wish, because it probably isn't fitting for a church platform. <laughs> but there's a reality to it. And I can wish a lot of things or I can do. And doing changes things. Action, stepping into it, matters. This idea about battling with sin, struggling with sin. I wish I wouldn't do this or I wish I could stop doing that. You can stop wishing. Start praying. Start leaning into Christ. Start trusting the Holy Spirit to walk you out of these places in your life. And stand firm in it. There's a benefit to being found. The second benefit to being found is this. It means you have a purpose. In your life right now, what are you living on purpose? Don't answer it out loud. I want you to really think about it for a few seconds. What are you living on purpose? You see, there's a difference between just living and living on purpose. I think that sometimes we, we confuse maintenance with purpose. We're like, I got, I got up today. That's awesome. Okay. There's a sloth somewhere in the world that got up today. Okay. I don't know why I chose a sloth. That was pretty random. But, that, but you're different. See, according to Peter, you've been set apart. You are, you are a peculiar people, which means you've been bought for a purpose, for a reason, 
with intentionality. The cross wasn't just this random thing that happened. The cross was so that you would begin to live with purpose in your life. And so often we get in this funk of just living for maintenance. And, and what I mean by that is, let me, let me say it this way. There are some things I got to do. Like, uh, there's some things I got I to gotta make sure my kids survive. Right? It's a pretty basic one. If I, if I don't do the basic things to help my kids survive, food, shelter, those kind of things, clothing, if I don't, then I'm considered negligent. And so there's some basic maintenance things that I have to do. But that's not all that I do. Because see, I don't, my goal isn't for my kids to survive. I hear people say this all the time. I just hope they make it. No, 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 no. I don't want them to just make it. I want them to be known in heaven. I want hell to be afraid of my children. I want, uh, you guys heard me say this about Miss Virgie when she looked at me with that little old wrinkly smiley face and she said, when my feet hit the ground, hell shakes because I know I'm awake. That's the purpose that I want in my children. That's the, that's, I'm not just hoping they eat ramen today for lunch and make it to dinner. I have a purpose in them that says, no, 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 no. You need to step beyond just existing and live for purpose. But what are you living? What is the purpose you're living for? Oh, Vince, I think I'm supposed to just try to get through this world as best I can. That's weak. You can be offended if you want. That's weak. We have a purpose given to us by God. I love this analogy. My, my, kids, my kids ride dirt bikes. They love motorcycles, Braden especially. He's had several of them. And this week they got out one of our old ones. I say it's an old one. It's about a 2000, maybe five model. So it's several years old. But it's a little KTM. It's Braden's second dirt bike. He started riding this dirt bike when he was about ooh, 10, maybe. He was racing it until he was about 12. And so he's riding this dirt bike. Man, he's loving it. So it got a little, he got a little big for it. And so we were like, hey, what else to do but add more power? So we had that thing bored out a little bit. Now, I'm telling you, this little dirt bike, a little two-stroke, it was a screamer, all right? I can remember getting on it, and I'm just, I'm just a smidge over 200 pounds. Rude. Okay, I'm maybe two smidges over 200 pounds. I don't even, do you know what a smidge? I don't know. So anyway, I'm on this dirt bike and I'm like, well, I want to see what it's got. Well, so I lean into it a little bit. Third gear, this thing hits wide open and I lean into it. Power band jumps in. Again, I'm a little heavier than my 12 year old son is. And this thing in third gear stands straight up with me and I'm leaning on it, trying to get it to get down. I'm like, oh, he's going to love this. <laughs> like a good father, you know. Here, this will kill you. <laughs> Find a helmet. <laughs> and so, so it's been, it's, been in a, it's been in the garage for years, literally for years. We, we got it out because Parker was like, hey, I think I want to start riding again. And I'm like, okay, well, let's just get it out because it may be too small for you now. So Braden gets it out. Hasn't been started in a while. Braden gets out there. Now my son Braden, who's been riding for a long time, is now 18 years old. He gets on this thing and he kicks it. And man, as soon as he kicks it, that thing wow, starts up. And because it sat, the throttle had stuck wide open. I know moms are like, oh. dads are like, what happened next? <laughs> so Braden hits this thing, throttle stuck wide open. In the mid, he's in the, on pavement in the front of our house because we don't live out in the country anymore. So we're, and he's on pavement. This thing stands up, whoom, shoots him right down the street. He's like running and you can't keep up with it. So finally he just tries to manhandle and get on top of it. The handlebars are bent because it's been sitting in the garage for years. And so he finally yanks it, gets it in the ditch, tears his thumb up. He's got skin marks on it. He walks back up to the house. He comes in, his eyes are about this big. He comes in, he goes, it's faster than I remember. By the end of the day, he had it toned down. He got the throttle unstuck, and he come in and bandage. I hope you have kids that are self-sufficient. Then my kids will make their own band-aids. Because I'm, I don't know why I don't buy band-aids with three boys in my house. I just always forget. So like, there's paper towel with electrical tape and all kinds of stuff. 
and he walks in like a cartoon thrum, pow, you know. And I was like, hey, you good? He was like, yeah, he said, it just, man, he said, I didn't, he said, I just forgot how much power was there. I love it when my kids preach. And I wonder, in regards to the purpose in your life, you forgot how much power is there. You forgot that this world does not exist for you, but you for its maker. And there is power available. There is purpose available. Check this out. What are you doing right now that is driven by purpose in your life? I want you to catch this verse in Ephesians. This is a super familiar passage in Ephesians. We know this passage. We, typically, we know it from memorization from another version of Scripture that says, For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's a gift from God, lest any man should boast. That's the version most of us know. This is another version that says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. That's the faith part, when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. But I want you to catch the next part. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created in us anew in Christ Jesus. He has created us new in Christ Jesus. If you are new, then you don't have the old purpose in your life. You have a new purpose in your life in Christ Jesus. Why? So that, so, so we can accomplish the good things he planned for us. When did he plan them, church? You have a purpose. I could take you back to the Old Testament spin of this scripture in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, that says, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, and they are good. They're good. Some of you are missing the purpose because you're not leaning into the throttle enough with God. You're not leaning into him enough. You say, listen, I don't know how much is there. Lean into it a little bit. You'll find out how much is there. You say, Vince, it's a little scary. I guarantee if it's anything like riding that dirt bike, it's terrifying. <laughs> but I will also tell you, you will experience things in your life that you never thought possible. But Vince, I don't know if I can live by purpose. I promise you, you can, but you've got to trust. And that's the big question on purpose is trust. When we started Real Life Church a few years back, I can remember I was working another full-time job and I was trying to pastor Real Life Church. And we had just got started and God was doing some amazing things. And, and, and so we were cranking, but I was working Monday through Friday and I was on call a lot of weekends because I did medical equipment. And so I was driving my big old green truck around, delivering oxygen, hospital beds, bedside commodes, all that good stuff. Me and God just driving one day and he says, hey, do you trust me? I'm like, well, God, we, we're killing it right now, man. We started this church. People are coming. Altars are full every weekend. It's fantastic. Yeah, I trust you, God. He said, then why do you spend all your time driving this truck instead of working what I've called you to do? I'm like, God, wait, hold, hold up, Lord. Your Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. And so I'm working because my kids need to eat. I got five kids at home at this time. Two of them are not even in school yet. So, Lord, I, I'm, I'm doing what I can do. And he said, do you trust me? I'm like, yeah, I trust you, God, but I got to do this. He said, I, I want you to see what can happen if you trust me. I want, I want you to see what can happen if you completely lean into the purpose that I have for you and not just kind of into the purpose I have for you. I'm like, well, God, I'm, I'm wearing myself out. I'm working 40, 50 hours a week, and then I'm going to work to church 40, 50 hours a week after I get off. I mean, isn't that enough? And he's like, you're working, but you're not trusting. Vince, do you trust me? So I went and talked to the church. I got our team together, and I said, hey, I just feel like God's calling me to, to step into this. What does that look like? And I can remember it was a month before I had that conversation with him. In a four-week month, we had an offering, our offerings were $89, $149, I think, and there were two weeks that were less than those two weeks that followed. So like, total for the month was like 400 bucks. And two of the weeks, the reason I don't know what the other two weeks were is because two weeks back to back, our offering got stolen before we left the church building. <laughs> uh, you're like, who would steal from a church? Anybody. Anybody will. So 
This isn't a judgment on whoever stole from the church. I pray God blessed them. But so we literally had a month of offering that was about, you know, $230. And they said, Pastor Vince, this is all we can do. This is, this is where we're at. With what we had saved up, we can pay you $220 a week. We can pay you $220 a week. And I said, okay. And they said, do you want to talk about it? I said, no. They said, is that okay? I'm like, that's not up to me. So I went home and I prayed. I talked to Jennifer. I prayed. Got up, went to work the next day. Walked in and said, hey, thank you so much for the opportunity to work here. I quit. And they're like, what do, you, what do you mean you quit? I'm like, I mean I quit. Here's my two-week notice. I'm going to work for you as long as I can. They were like, hey, we have a non-compete. You can't work here two weeks after you put in your notice, so we're just going to let you go. I'm like, awesome. And I went home and I started working God's church, $220 a week. Our rent was $800 a month for a family of six, seven, however many we had at that time. There's a bunch of us. And we trusted. And we trusted. I said, God, I, I know my purpose. I know you called me to my purpose, but now I'm trusting you in my purpose. And so I'm just, I'm going hang, I'm, I'm to I'm hang on to you and let go of everything else. Please keep my kids safe. That was my prayer. Two weeks after we made that move and I was going to the pawn shop every day and flipping and just working. Just doing, I was going to visit people and talking with people. Two weeks after I walked out one Sunday morning and nearly tripped on my front porch. There was an enormous box on my front porch. I resigned in the middle of summer and school was coming and so we were in mid-July and school was going to start in August. And I walk out and I open this big old box and there's brand new shoes for all my kids. There's clothes, there's school supplies, they've got everything. I still have no idea where that box came from. But what God showed me when I stepped out the door and saw that was, now you're trusting me. And if you'll trust me in your purpose, I will never leave you or forsake you in the purpose, ever. Are you living for purpose or have you just got comfortable maintaining this life? I'm not saying you got to quit your job and go work for the church for $200 a week. I'm not saying you got to quit your job and move to a mission field in Africa. I'm not saying any of those things unless God is asking you to do those things. And if God is asking you to do those things, let me be the first to tell you, don't miss it. Don't miss stepping into God's purpose for your life. The last thing that I want to hit on, the perk, this benefit of being found. It's not only that we get to defeat sin in our life. It's not only that I get to live with a purpose every day. Yes, I can make my kids survive. But see, my purpose says I get to load them up in that bow called the gospel and fire them off into the future as an arrow, taking a legacy of Christ forward. That's what I get to do as a purpose in my life. It's not only those things, but it's also the knowledge that I'm safe. See, I know, I know that when this life ends, I get to go home. Home, home. I have an address here in town. I've lived in different places all over the country. Michigan to Ohio to California, Western Arkansas, Northern Arkansas, Kentucky. I don't talk about that one much. And I've yet to make it home. I love knowing that I'm home, but here's what the Peter says about going home, this idea of being safe. I know because of my relationship with Christ. What I fear in the American church is this. We have this, there's a moment in the New Testament where Paul gets this opportunity to go preach in front of a king. It's really more of a regional director type of role, but they called him king, King Agrippa. And as Paul goes before him, Paul gets this opportunity, and Paul does what Paul does, man. He cuts the wood. He lays out the gospel. Jesus came so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus came and lived a perfect, sinless life, ministered for three years, and then was crucified, 
buried and resurrected again with eyewitnesses that saw his resurrection. He has now ascended into heaven to sit on the right hand of the Father to prepare a place for me so that if he goes one day, I might also be with him. He lays down this message in front of King Agrippa and Agrippa says the most painful words any preacher has ever heard in his life. He he says, Paul, almost you have persuaded me to be as you are. And I think my fear for our church and for our churches across the nation is that we've almost sold completely out to God. We've almost given everything for the purpose of God. We've almost given everything to fighting sin in our life. We've almost done it, but but I don't know if it's safe over there. It's safe. Do you know how safe you are in Christ? This is how much he loves you. I talk to people often and I hear this phrase, well, you know, Vince, Jesus said he's coming back, but it's been how many thousands of years since the Bible was written and he still hasn't come back, came back yet. I mean, the disciples thought he was coming back and he didn't come back then. And then you have other places in history. They thought he was coming back and he didn't come back then. You can even hear it now. Well, look at the world around us. We're in the end times. We've got to be surely. Listen, here's what I know. And it's really elementary. So if you want to, if it's not smart enough for you, that's okay. I'm not offended. I'm not a smart fella. Jesus didn't come back yesterday. So I'm closer today to him coming back. I don't know when it's going to be, but I'm closer right now even than I was when I got up this morning. But what I do know is that I don't doubt Jesus. What I figure his stall is, what I figure he's waiting on is for me to live out my purpose. Because me living out my purpose means I reach one more person. You living out your purpose means that you reach one more person. You don't believe me? Read the scripture. Peter says the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. God is not waiting on anything but you. He's either waiting on you to say yes to his purpose and accept him as your savior or he's waiting for you to fulfill the purpose to live it out like he called you to live it out. 